Uh, well, I'm going to be talking about here how we productionalize machine learning at Groupon. Uh, we are working at scale, and the thing we learned during the process, uh, I've been working as well with Nick from the beginning of this project, and of coming from a naive base with prior to using machine learning actually in a recommendation system. So to give you one, one example of how it looks like, uh, I remember one night I was debugging at like 10, 11 p.m., the first version of the model. And I file a request with my phone. I grab the request, I go there, and I fire two clusters, two hoses. One has the previous version, the naive base with priors. And the other one has uh, a gradient boosting tree. So I start looking and, and start seeing what deals have been returning. Is this a recommendation system? So there's personalization. There's a lot. There's context involved. There's a lot of things going on. And I remember it was like a debugging, and suddenly in the sec first or second deal, I saw this amazing deal on the Jota one. Jota is our nickname for uh, all what we're doing with the gradient boosting trees and H2O. So I, I saw something very cool there. It's a very nice deal. I like it very much. It's a steakhouse. And, and I, I went back to the other feed and see what it had. And it was not there in the top position. So we had like a position 12 or position 13. So I started realizing the impact of this is that it actually is taking, uh, is understanding the relationship between the features more than we can do using uh, an algorithm that we create by hand uh, and putting features by hand. This is a connection of features, relationships. The other one is multiplications of a features in a, in a single line. It's like it's a very simple formula. And that made me understand that we are in the correct path. We, path. we actually creating a good recommendation system. Uh, with that, I actually became the first customer of machine learning because I bought a ticket, a deal. So yeah. That's a, um, so now I'm going to talk about here that uh, what I want you to take uh, home is, or what we'll learn is, how to build reliable machine learning. When I talk about reliable machine learning, not only talking about you create a model and you trust the output of your model. You say it's blue and it always says blue, that's a reliable machine learning, right? It's, in our case, it goes more. We talk, we're talking about productive environments. We're talking about this is a model that's going to be deployed to production. Uh, it's going to be serving real time, and when you serve real time, you're making money, you're losing money. And when, if we want to understand what's happening behind that model, we want to be able to answer any questions, because when you start losing money from top to down, the questions are going to be done, and we have to answer those. Like, which feature are you using? Which data set will you use? Uh, do you apply any query, any constraint, anything to the data that could explain the behavior of the model right now? That is reliable machine learning. Reliable means you can reproduce a model every time, any time. That's, well, that's our goal. So that's why uh, we start using H2O and MFLOW together. So H2O we use it for training our models. MFLOW uh, we discovered is amazing for tracking our models. So um, I don't want to spend much time in this, com in this slide. This is what we are, this Groupon. Uh, Groupon is a, con uh, it's a marketplace where you can connect customers to merchants. Uh, the merchants of offer a bunch of deals on, on, the, on, the, on the, our marketplace with Groupon and expose them to new customers that will not have opportunities. So we try to aim more for the local businesses. We try to expose those businesses that, uh, in all the case, will not have the way or infrastructure to show, hey, to the, this bunch of customers, I, I, I exist and I offer this. Uh, it actually uh, it helps. We have helped a lot to the local customers, uh, lo local business, sorry. Uh, we actually, uh, and that is not 183 million, but right now we are in 200 million uh, downloads. So it's, I believe people like our app and start using it. But the most important thing is uh, what we're doing here. I want to spend a little more time in this slide. Uh, this slide is kind of the architecture of what we're trying to do and the strategy we applied. So 
The, I always like to resume uh, to make an uh, abstract or explain the problem we're doing, like finding a, a needle in a haystack. The problem is just the haystack is very big. Uh, we're talking about we have more than one million deals uh, available for scoring at this precise moment. And we only have 300 milliseconds to do that. I and mean, it's not only for scoring. We have to receive a request, understand the request, divide the context, grab information from the user, grab information from the context, understand where the user is located. Then we go there and we fetch information with the deals based on this context information. We produce a ranking of the deals. We select the top K, we return it, we score them, we decorate them. We mix them following because we have to have freshness in the, in the algorithm and then we respond to that to the user in 300 milliseconds. So the scoring is of course less than 300 milliseconds. And when we, when we try applying machine learning, we find out that is a huge constraint. This 300 milliseconds was the first thing I faced as an engineer working in Groupon. Uh, I still uh, f uh, face it and it's make me as an engineer to become better because it, it make me understand that performance is very important when you're designing something from scratch. So um, our models, uh, in the online models, because of this, can't be uh, complex ones. So the online model, we only can have, we test it in the performance and we achieve like with 15 or 20 trees in a really boosting tree, which is very shallow, it's a very small uh, model, is what we can do so we don't break that, um, that 300 millisecond line that we have as a constraint. So we, de we decided to, hey, let's work in, in two different uh, models. We have an offline model that runs in batch scoring that can be as complex as we can. And we have an online model it's a simple model that just understands simple features. So let's talk about first the, the online model. Um, I, I, I give this talk in the H2 award, that's why I have this, the, the, the logo there. And most of the questions came off, uh, after the presentation about this part. So um, we're, we are using H2O because of the modules. The uh, H2O is um, an, uh, produce two types of, of outputs. It produce a POYO, which is a plain old, old Java object, which contains the, uh, the model itself and all the information you can have, but as well produce a MOJO. This MOJO is exportable and it's, it's a jar. This element, we create a plugin on Elasticsearch. That plugin Elasticsearch, we inclu included this POYO at this brain of it. This is a scoring brain. And now when we receive the features, which are going to be in Elasticsearch query, in Elasticsearch cluster, sorry, we actually understand it and we score them inside Elasticsearch. So that model is, if we have n, uh, um, the, the cluster is size n. In each element of that cluster, we have that model running. So when we open the chart, charts and we start seeing the deals are indexed in each one of the parts of the cluster, we actually are scoring it, not with Elasticsearch's uh, scoring plugin, it's with our own, our own powered by this H2O model. That's why it has to be a simple one, because we can't, if we delay Elasticsearch in that moment, our system will start uh, having performance issues and then we could not go further. And um, that is like the, 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 one of the great things we achieve in this part of the element. It's like, how can we score it and use the power of Elasticsearch as well at the same time? The second part is the batch scoring. So uh, the problem is we don't have contextual features there. We only know the information that happened, uh, we, but we don't have information of user relation or the, anything that's happened with the user regarding the model. So the, the, the deal. So we can only look into the deals. So the cool thing about it is that we can go as complex as we want with the features. So we can include uh, very complex features because time is not there to, to stop us. So we can actually run a very heavy complex model uh, we actually could, we could have as a feature a multinomial model as well 
And then we, what we do is we score each model, each deal that ha we, we have in our database, and we index that information, that deal quality score, as we call it, in the last search cluster per deal. So when we go to that, uh, when we come with an online model, we just search for that score, and we have, well, we have, in, in a, it's a bucket, it's a matrix of scores, what we, what we produce per deal. So based on the context, based on the evaluation, we can select the precise score we want, and we can understand how this model was behaving in the past based on the knowledge we have, based on the knowledge, the, and based on what this, the model, offline model, is capturing from that model. And we, in, we make them together, and we create the, the personalized response. So the online model only has the contextual features, user features, and those features, uh, and that deal quality score as an input. This, this simplicity help us to enhance our scoring pro process and help us making, um, including new features, including trying to play with more and more elements so we can produce a better, better every time uh, a new models and produce better responses. We produce this without using a machine learning pipeline powered by sparking water. So basically, uh, data set is in Hadoop file systems. And all what we do, we do in a Spark context. So we train uh, in integration with uh, Sparking Water and MLflow. So each model we train is actually stored. And not only is the, models we, the, the, the model itself, it's the information, we ha the, the hyperparameters, the query, the data, the dates, anything that was used to produce a model was stored in MLflow. We do uh, evaluations before we launch a model to see how the, the model is behaving using Tableau. So we can lo load the model, we can mirror traffic to it, and we can start seeing how the distribution of deals. Uh, does it make sense, does it not make sense? Uh, what if we can tune just a calibration process? We can play with it. And then we're happy with it, we can go further. And finally, we use Airflow to do the orchestration of all the steps of the machine learning pipeline. Well, I have like a, we can show you later the, the machine learning pipeline. So um, this is a, a very straightforward machine learning uh, life cycle. This is a, actually the model life cycle I, I see in a lot of presentations and papers. Uh, there's nothing new in this one. Uh, in our opinion, and on what we feel is that data is now, in this moment, the, uh, the first citizens. It's that you have to treat it well. If something's wrong with your data, something's going to be wrong with your model. So if something happens, you have to treat it if, when you have a problem with your data, you have to treat it as a bug in production. If your code is failing. So you have to open your code, you have to understand what's happening. Because you just, one day of data you miss is a, it's a lot of data. Uh, so you have to create all these alerts, all this information regarding your data so you can validate your data in the moment you're processing it. Because if you don't, you could be having problems like, oh, one week later, you figure out I was not logging correctly the distance. So all this, this data I have is worthless. I can't train a model based on a lie. I have to train a model based on true. So feature engineering and feature selections are two key elements when you try and create a model from scratch. Um, as well as feature selection, I have to say, you have to have an um, understanding of how complex is the feature going to be into introducing into your model. If it's a real-time model, you have to understand how this uh, feature is going to be computed. Because sometimes the computation of a feature by itself can take more than the of what the model itself has to use for training, or for prediction. Uh, I've seen that. So sometimes you have this nice feature you have there. This is a matrix factorization that uh, has answers of everything. But when you're scoring deal users, it, 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 it is too much. And you, then you say, yeah, sorry, it's a good model. Let's, it's a good feature. Let's see how we can use it in another context. Can we catch it? Can we or can we use it offline instead? It's the feature selection, you have to understand the scope of your model. 
the model building and the model tuning, uh, that's a very interesting element. I believe everybody has struggled uh, building and tuning models, uh, understanding which hyperparameters you're going to be using, which algorithm you're going to be using, which tool you're going to be using. Uh, and then uh, you go there and you do the grid search. Sometimes your model can take two or three days to, to produce, to, to train. And you're doing research, it could be a week of data of, of just sitting there expecting it to conclude the training. So this time here, so you have to have a conscious of what you're going to be doing, how it's going to be training. Uh, actually, what we do in most of the cases, we reduce the number of the data when we're exploring and then we expand it when we want to understand if actually that's uh, a good model. And then you evaluate the model. We use Tableau to understand not, it's not only uh, using the test data set, we use real-time data set sometimes. And we want to understand how the model is behaving. It is true what it's saying. Because at the end of the day, it's a relationship. Uh, sometimes with the models, you can't understand exactly which are the relationships they're creating. So you want to understand that, it act, that what you're training and what you're having actually is what you're expecting to have. And after all you have, all these checks have uh, passed, you can start serving this model into production. And that's another problem, because at the moment you serve your model in production, in that precise moment, the models start suffering some uh, decay. And that's another problem. So we faced all these issues. Uh, I've, I'm saying that uh, we started uh, with a very small project. We started in a week of date, in a week we have something like a geekon, it's like hackathon. So we have this idea of we could use a, a model into Elasticsearch and score the last and uh, score from there, and then we can do as complex as we can. So because we started that way, we started like a POC. We started with not the best approaches of engineering, and we continue growing and growing and growing and growing, and then we have to stop in a moment and say, yeah, we're suffering. What are we suffering? So uh, I tried to, paint, to pinpoint here the major pain points we had when we were uh, creating this uh, machine learning pipeline. And I believe this is the, the ones that hurt us the most. So first of all, choice of machine learning library. Um, you have to understand that there's a lot of tools there. So you have to understand which is the one you're going to be using that's going to be solving your problem. And uh, why you need it. Because uh, people come with a magic wand and say, yeah, you only have to use SparkML because SparkML is the best thing. Or you, have, you can use MLib, you can use, right now everybody's talking about TensorFlow. And TensorFlow this, TensorFlow that, but then you ask, okay, cool. Now, how can I wrap TensorFlow? Put in Elasticsearch query, does it work? Oh no, why not? Because we cannot do it. So you, you, just have, you, you, just have, you have to dig in and you have to choose, choose which is your machine learning thing. But then, when you have it, you have to communicate it to the rest of the team. Because right now, I'm group and uh, we, we are using H2O, all the groups are using H2O, but then still all the groups are using another one. So when you create the models, you want to be reproducible, no matter which tool you're using. You want to have a communication, a good communication with your team. So the next step is re reproduction results. So the, the, most, the, theory, the, the thing I fear the most is dropping a model into production and not knowing how it was trained. So you train your model. I believe everybody, or most of us, has worked on, on, on notebooks. So notebooks is volatile. You, you write your stuff, you maybe didn't commit it, and you, you just, oh, you, you create your model in your notebook, and then you submit it. And you, uh, yeah, I produce it, it's nice, beautiful, perfect. It, I name it model release version 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, and there it is, it's in my Zeppelin or it's my, in Jupyter or it's on all, all, all the uh, notebook, I don't know. Then, two months later, two weeks later, three weeks later, someone will come and ask you, yeah, man, which was the model we use? And uh, can, you, like, can, can we train the same model with another data? Or can we include a new feature to that data we use? And you go back and you go to see your notebook and say, ha, ah, this is version 1.1, 1 .1, 0 0.2. Uh, this, is, this, this is the version. This is the real version. And you say, oh, oh okay, I, I kind of don't remember which was the notebook I used. So you go and you check in your, in your spreadsheets and you say, oh, okay, I didn't fill it up. Or, uh, or I'm sure this is the one I used for, for production environment. 
So I want to take out of the head of, of the guys who are doing modeling. Uh, that shouldn't be the case. When you train your model, it should be automatically being uh, store all the information you have. It's not the model itself. It's the hyperparameters you use. It's the query you use. It's the data you use. It's the data you use. Validations you, you use. The split, the, the split you use for creating the training and the test data set. Everything counts when you're creating a model because the algorithm is static. The algorithm will not change. You set the same seed with the same data and will produce the same result. The important is the data. You have to understand the data. The data has to be, and it's, the data is very, it's, it's, like, it's the source of your machine learning model because we're learning from it. You change it, you only have another model. So we have to be sure that we have that clear and clear, crystal clear, and we have a store in a safe place. So that's come with tracking models. We want to track every model we train. No matter it was a bad model, it was a good model. Every model we are training has to be tracked. So we can go back there and analyze why it was bad, why it was good, and why this feature, this model was best. And maybe you will say, okay, this model was bad, but maybe because the query was wrong, because the feature are correct. So you, you can compare and you can have insights of your model in a very simple way. That's what we're like looking to have. And then come the reviewing models. Uh, when you're going to production, uh, most of the cases, or at least the code, when you're coding, you go, you submit your code to GitHub and you receive a pull request. And then you have your community of software engineers that review your code and they say, yeah, you can go or you have to change this. That's not happening quite often with models. You create the model, you wrap it up, and you say, hey, I have a winner. That winner is going to production. It's going to make money. It's going to lose money. We have to review it. So we have to go back and give us infrastructure to say, hey, to the community of all the data scientists in your team, in your work, say, I want to launch this. I am using these features. I am using this thing. This is the evolution to take me here to choose this model as a winner. It's not because I have a, a magic wand and say, this is a model. You, ha you, ha you have to have that thing. And then I will ask it. Do you try this? Do you try the following? And you can say yes or no. I can actually see it. It has to be immutable. It has to be in a friendly way. So then you have to deploy your models, track the experiments, and then finally measure your decay. So when you're measuring your decay, that's interesting. So let's say you train a model and you apply some constraints to your model. Let's say uh, group on it. We have local deals, we have good deals, and we have travel deals. So let's say I train only for local deals. And suddenly I'm training my decay for, uh, I, I, I have my model and I'm streaming all the data. All the data is goods deals, travel deals. And I say, I'm alarmed because my model is not behaving correctly. Wrong. Is that, is, I, I'm, train, I'm testing or measuring my, my model with the data is incorrect data. I only have to train, to test it with the data I train with with a query I apply. So if, they, if I'm going to train a model for only for local context, I have to apply that model to local context. So it's going to be easy if you only have one model. But when you have 100 models serving in productions, it's very hard to, to keep track which is the model have which query. So you have to rely on something, a management element, that will help you do that for you. So we... Uh, define the four use cases that wrap up our problems. So the four use cases we are looking for is reproducibility, model management, governance, and evaluation. Um, when we talk about reproducibility and the problems of, uh, regarding, uh, and as well as management, but with something important in governance, and I believe the most important thing in governance is understanding the model and the features you have. You're governing you have, you have a, 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 a place where you can put the hat and understand exactly which models you, you have and how those models are trained. Uh, I don't know if uh, all you guys are aware of the name GDPR. GDPR was something that happened like last year. Um, during the Europeans didn't want to use, uh, put a lot of restrictions on the data we can use uh, on production. 
So for instance, uh, we only can have three decimal points on that, and, and that long. We can have information directly from the user. There's a lot of elements that constrain uh, what we can use offline. I mean, that information even though it's stored in database. Uh, so if you have one of those after, uh, if you have one of those elements was restricted after a, a period of time, I can't remember the date, you could get sued and you're going to lose because the uh, Congress said, the European Congress says, you have to remove that information. If any customer asks you, are you using my data? And you say, yes, you have a problem. So how, why I'm saying GDPR here? How do you know if you have 100 feature models, 1,000 models, I don't know how, how, how can grow this in the future. How can you, how you can, reliably evaluate each model in a very fast tempo and understand which feature are you using. Are these features okay or I have to exclude them from my models, real time models. So you can flag them and say these models are wrong and they flag them and you have to retrain them taking out that feature. It's sad that you have to take a feature out from a model. This is the saddest thing that happen. But well, um, data scientists are not, a, are not lawyers. so. <laughs> Uh, and at the end, well, uh, evaluation. You have to be able to evaluate your models constantly. Constant evaluation of the model because you, each model will decay in a, different, in a different tempo. So you have to understand in which moment are you going to be firing the, the uh, retraining of your models. Because if you refresh every day, maybe you didn't have time to settle down your model. If you, ref if you don't refresh in a period of time, maybe there's something, a new trend happening, and you're just not cutting, uh, uh, grabbing it, and then you're losing market there. So it's a lot of things. It's a, it's a very interesting problem what we're facing right now. So what we choose cho uh, was MFLOW. The MFLOW is from Databricks. Right now, there's Spark Summit, and they're going to be presenting, I believe, tomorrow about MFLOW, tomorrow and, or the day before, after tomorrow. Uh, it's just presented, I believe, two years ago as well in Databricks. Uh, it's an open source. Uh, what it does is it's divided in three elements. Uh, so I have, I believe, here, have tracking, have projects and models. We're only working right now with tracking. So we track all the models. What I like of it is that it provides a simple API and as has as well a REST API. So um, it's very easy to create a piece, little piece of code so when you, create, you train your model, you can create an MFLOW instance and you can say, I'm going to grab the information, I'm going to store it in that MFLOW and that's going to be there forever, unless you delete it, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's very simple. It's a very simple integration. So you have a REST API, you have a, a Scala, well, Java API, Python API, R API, and can be used in a very simple way and can be used in a, in a pipeline, which is what we're doing at the end of the day. And so this is more or less what we do. Yes? So are you looking at exploring it? So you said you're right now you're only using tracking? Uh, right now we're using tracking because, for instance, uh, models... Are you exploring other, other areas or are you you're looking for other, using other tools to, to take care of those other needs? Okay, that's a good question. For models, we, models is used for uh, making, deploying, in, in deploying your models, deploying the artifact. We actually have something built, custom built in, in, in group and called Flux. Uh, nobody's gonna know Flux because it's, <laughs> it's something local. But we, we, what we have is what deploy, is Flux is something similar to what um, MFLOW models are gonna be. So what we do is that we train the model we give it to, to Flux and Flux deploy the model in the, in the last source cluster for us. If we didn't have that, we should uh, be start thinking about models. But models could be used, uh, actually has a lot of integrations if you want to work in the cloud. So you, you want to control, you have your artifact and you want to control your artifact in the cloud. Uh, MemeFlow models, that part will help you very much because it has integration with Amazon, have integration with Azure, and have integration with Google. So the big free clouds you, you have integration done. And projects, projects is a very nice uh, uh, idea. Uh, I use it just a little bit. 
what it does is the following. You have your, you, you, have, you have your artifact. You just say the versions you're going to be using. And you say, OK, this is the model they have. This is the versions I'm using of Spark or whatever you're using, uh, so H2O, or all the tools. Uh, you, create, you, you start creating a recipe, a YAML recipe. And then with MLflow project, you say, I want to rerun that uh, execution I did two weeks ago. And I want to rerun it with this new fresh data. I only will do it for you from a single command line. That, that's reproducibility. And that, uh, because we are building all this infrastructure by hand, <laughs> I haven't had time to do that part yet. Uh, I did explore it, and I did saw it uh, as a very potential. Uh, it's a very interesting element. Uh, that's like the second element I'm going to be fo focusing in the, in the next quarters. But right now, I'm focusing on finishing what's going to be track, uh, the tracking process, which is almost done in our case. Uh, because the tracking is, we're using it as well, not only for track the models, but also use this model for evaluation, constant evaluation in real time. No problem. So this is our integration of uh, MLflow. Okay, this is our integration for MLflow. This is how we're working. So what we have is a raw data uh, that's in Hadoop, and we do a process of this data, and we do the feature engineering. This feature engineering is going to be the input of our, of our training. So we split this training uh, in two, in this data set in two, in the training data set and the test data set. The test data set is going to be hidden for the training. Uh, because we are measuring events from the future, we split by date. Because we don't want to use future events, events to Tangle or make, mix with uh, past elements on the training data set because we might actually want to pre predict those. So what we do is like we say, okay, we train with uh, from this date from this date to the start date, from this date to end date, we reserve it, and we will try to predict if the AUC or log loss of the models are actually correct and similar with the training and the test that you see because is that is the way we can say. This model actually is predicting the future because we have the future data here. We do the training and the model evaluation using uh, Tableau and Sparking Water. Every model that's getting out from that box are going to be in MLflow. Every model we train. Uh, at this moment, I'm, train, I'm creating a, a, a little script that will help me as well with AutoML uh, because AutoML only grab the last one. But I want to grab as well the leaderboards. So as Sparkling Water, uh, as HUO has something called AutoML. AutoML helps you train models um, in a smart way, doing so it's a gr smart grid search. It's not a grid search, grid search. It's a smart grid search. So it has focus in several uh, hyperparameters. And you can define, OK, I want to train this model. I want to use, uh, maybe I want to use logistic regressions. I want to use GVM. Maybe I want to use deep learning. Maybe I want to uh, use. Uh, embedding of two of two of, of those and then it does it for you and then says to you after two or three days it says okay this is the leaderboard this is the best model we can produce and this is the element so you grab the that that leader and then you say okay now you're going to be playing with this guy what if i start including more features what if i start tuning these knobs on what if i start using another hyperparameters so you can actually Make it better or make it worse, but at least you're playing with it. But at least you have a warm up, a place where you start. Uh, and all those elements have to be there in MLflow. So you have the tracking and knowledge of what happened. Then, after you have a candidate, you can publish it. Uh, you start serving real time production, uh, real time. Um, real-time uh, requests and you're actually making you it's, it's very it's very nice you when you open your app and you say yeah i am i'm receiving this so you're you kind of peeking and you're trying to see is it correct is it incorrect why is it showing so much local why is it showing so much goods it's a very interesting problem and then you can you do the you use mlflow to do the evaluation and we do real-time evaluation do, uh, using kibana or um, um, where, the name of the other one, sorry, 
uh, where we can evaluate and we can see how the model is actually behaving in real time. Oh, so this is more or less the pipeline we created. Uh, this is orchestrated by Airflow. So the first process is uh, our congestion task. What we do here is that we pre-process the information of the data set. So we have to introduce the clean data set to the models we're going to be training. In the feature transformation, sometimes we have a problem that uh, the features are so complex we cannot use as it is. So we have to transform them because HUO is a very smart guy, but it understands strings, it understands doubles, it understands dates, int, etc., but does not understand um, hash map. So we have to pre-process that hash map. We have to understand what that hash map means so we, so we can introduce it to uh, HUO as a single feature. So HUO can go from there to, pre uh, to use it in, in, in the training, for instance. Maybe we want to explore it to several features. Or maybe we can say we're only interested in uh, this subset of the hash map, and then we, you explode it, or you only use one element. This is, a, this is a lot of elements you have to do there. And this is actually the hardest part. So you train it, and you do the scoring and evaluation. So you grab the information from MLflow. You, you score that, that model real time and then you evaluate it and then you refresh. So this is, the, this, is a pr this is a process we're doing right now to evaluate the models in real time. I don't have the training there because the training is al already happening. We're already serving that model in production. It's on already in the model registry. So we are in this case, in this moment, evaluating the models as it is. So I uh, would like to show you a quick demo of this. Uh, how much time? Seven minutes. Uh, four minutes. Four minutes. Okay. So, uh -huh. so basically, this is I, I create a script. So we launch this script into 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 production. This is actually is this is a Hadoop cluster at this moment. So we grab this element, we wrap it, and we launch it into a Spark environment. What we did in this case, we created a configuration file where we are mapping uh, only uh, GBM, CRF, and, and logistic regressions. Uh, we're saying uh, to, to the model oh, and to, to the script, what are we going to do and how we're going to train? So this element has the integration of HUO flow, H -H -O, Spark and Water, and ML flow. And what we do is that we create this, the context and the uh, MFLOW uh, in instances. And we do all that in a, in a Scala code that we built here in Groupon. So this is more or less the configuration files. You can see we're applying some queries, the features. Uh, you have the, the configuration you have for, like say, the, the trees, et cetera. I kind of go very fast, but you can set every configuration here. Uh, you basically, after this, you just have to, am I? And this moment, they just start training a model with that data, with that information. Yeah, it's already training. So in, in a while, let's say starting to issue a context, blah, 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 blah. I don't have more time to show this. I'm going to kill it. Uh, eventually, this will finish. I will come, come here. This is MFLOW. So at this moment, uh, I trained with a very small data set. I, I just did a grid search uh, over a number of trees. But you can see that we actually you have all the information regarding how you train the model. That actually there's too much information. So let's, let's put it a little bit, little bit smaller. So you can actually see, OK, uh, and trees. Yeah. So you can actually go and see uh, how all, which mold you train. You can see the user's yarn, because this is a, uh, I train it with Spark. 
So this, this park is a giant cluster. So I can go and can see how this model and how the, the, the number of trees affected the AUC of this model. Uh, I don't trust very much in, the, in this model because I, it was a very, very small data set I created just to actually have something to show in a very fast tempo. Uh, but you can go and you can actually go here and you can say, I want to compare them. And you can compare each of the hyperparameters you use for the training. Even more, you can come here and you can say number of trees. And you want to see how the number of trees affected the, your, your metric, in this case, AUC, how the evaluation of your AUC was affected on the number of trees. And you can say that after this number of trees, uh, it got flattened. So we're talking about 25 or 50 trees get flattened. And, but then you want to check more about the model you choose. And you can come here and you can, you can come and you can see the parameters you use. But the most important thing is that you can say, OK, these are the features I use. This is the, the well, uh, MLflow in this version has a problem with the output. They put, uh, this is a pretty JSON, but I don't know why it's putting it in a text file. I, haven't yet go around, but because I can read it. Uh, it's been a struggle right now in the team. They want me to do it and as more pretty. I can do it an artifact. Because you can upload artifacts here, but I haven't had the time to do it. But at least you can log whatever you want to log. And the most important thing, uh, we're talking about input path. This is, a this is the path I use for training. And this is the query I apply for this model. So I, I, I excluded all the mobile search, all web search. I only use in those deals over lunch. And I only use in local deals. So when I can actually understand what was uh, produced for this model, and I didn't log it and when I was training the model, you see me doing it. I just hit a button and I just run it. I did it because I did integration with H2O and MFLOW offline. Um, then well, you have the model's output. This is the output of the model in HDFS. I just fetch it and just put it here. And I actually can see the model. And I can see the model, how it's behaving, and all the information I have from, uh, from, from Flow. So it's actually, it's, um, this integration is, is helped me, had helped us a lot. And as I'm going to show you a very scheme because I believe I have like one more minute of uh, time, this is over one, this is Quati. So this is the code I use for doing the integration for H2O. I create the context, and then I just wrap over the H2O uh, API what I want to do. And this creates everything for me. I have a small enumerator when I just say which of the, of the models are going to be supporting at the moment. And with this, I just create it with the parameters I need. And this is a simple integration of MLflow. And just using the API of MLflow, just the thing I'm doing some validations of it so I can be sure that when I log information, I actually log in it correctly. And then I just have a script that uses the H2O MFLOW, make it together, and start working in a very simple thing, using a sparking, a Spark, Hadoop file system, and HUO. That is the that is that is the goal to make it simple for our data, data scientists and make it simple to us to be sure that our data scientists are actually working correctly and are storing each each detail of the model in production. So this is our thing. Yes. So, so quick question. Uh, so all this integration with MLflow and H2O and Sparkling Water, is that sort of out of the box with all the open source? Or do you have any glue code to kind of make it actually all work together? So um, I, have to, I, had to, I had to code. I did have to code. Uh, so I use, a, I use the APIs that they are available to be used. So the APIs are there. The only thing I did is was uh, I saw there was the H H2O API, I had the MFLOW API, and I had to glue them together. So what I tried to do is uh, uh, to, create simple, so this, uh, to create simple classes, simple code, that 
understand only H2O, and then a simple code that only understand MFLOW, and then create a single script that says, okay, I want to train a model. I go to H2O, I have this MFLOW, so I create my model, and with MFLOW, I start logging that information. And actually, uh, the script is just a little bit big, but it's, it's this one. Oh. Um, So basically, I go through every step and I start, this is a big main, but this is a script. I just start using the code that I just showed you, what I did. Uh, I just grab information, uh, I, I process the information I'm using, I train the information, the data, and I do categorical calling because we need to do the categorical calling issue. And I just go and validate if I'm going to do some calibration steps using issue calibration, which is plots. Uh, plats, plats, plats and calibration. Uh, it's kind of a logistic regression over the tree, so it do a calibration of, on the leaves of the trees uh, using plats logistic regression. Um, if not, I use uh, plain, simple training validation steps. Uh, so this is simple, uh, and this is it. This is a simple integration with H2O and MFLOW. At the end of this, uh, at the end of this script, I I train models. I did grid search. I use AutoML if I had to out use AutoML and all the models are getting stored in MFLOW. I can show you a, a, a little scheme here. But, uh, I'm not the only one using MFLOW in my team. Um, all these are experiments. People are using it. Uh, if you go to there, you can go actually, I, 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 I shouldn't show anything uh, inside there, I can't. But if you go in, in one of those, you can start seeing, so for instance, uh, uh, we're, we're working to introduce a new feature. So we have three engineers working on that feature. Data scientists plus engineers. Uh, what we're doing is that we go back and say, hey, I want to train uh, a model. So sometimes somebody's working from home or somebody who just went to vacation, and they just say, what was the last model uh, Nick trained? So I go, I go to, his, uh, to, the, to this folder we're working together. I see what he's doing. And I say, huh, he's doing this, he's doing this. Oh, I didn't thought about this uh, hyperparameter. So you go, you go to, the, to, to check the books or check the H2O webpage, explain you each hyperparameter, and you say what it does. And then you apply it to your model with the feature you're trying to introduce. And that's collaborative working. You're learning from your teammates because you can see what they're doing. Sorry, I missed the first part of your talk. So, here we go. I missed the first part of your talk, my apologies, we were late. I was wondering, when you deploy a model, is it a jar, Java object that you deploy into each tool? So, H2O produce a module, a module. A module uh, is a jar. It's a, uh, you open them, it's a zip file. When you open the zip file, it's a jar. So, that jar itself, we deploy it in Elasticsearch cluster. We, we create a wrapper of the, of the Elasticsearch plugin. Uh, what we do, instead of using the scoring of Elasticsearch, we use uh, that module that's prepared to, to, to understand the features going to be receiving, and it's prepared to, to predict the information based on, what, uh, the, on the features. And that's what we're deploying. So it's, it is a jar. No problem. The, the slide that you had that talked about uh, deployment seems to be implying that the publishing was done from MLflow, because I was a little bit confused on that. Oh, yes. Um, it's, it's H2O, right? So, yeah. Um, Can you explain that a little bit? Yes, of course. Uh, actually, that's true. It's implying that we're using uh, MLflow. So, what we do is that, what we do is the following. We, we, have the, we have all our models stored in MFLOW, all of them. And as well, we have the, the artifacts, the, 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 the Mojo and the Pollo. Each one of those are stored as well. So what we do is that we flag, this is the model we're gonna be using for production. So uh, in this entries and manual step where we grab that uh, element because we are not using MFLOW to deploy it, we could, but we're, we're using uh, a tool that we have on in Groupon. 
And what we do is upload that model into, into Flux, and Flux does integration to Elasticsearch for us. Because, uh, but in the other cases, uh, you could flag this model and say, with uh, this one, models, uh, you could grab that run and say, I want to use the artifact produced by this model, and I want to deploy it in the cloud. We, that's not what we're doing right now, because we have something custom built right now in, in the company. But uh, MFLOW provides you the, the, the possibility of doing that. And you use Kubernetes? Uh, well, uh, we, in this case, we're not using Kubernetes. It's everything. We, you, you have Kubernetes uh, when we are running stuff in the cloud. We do have something running in the cloud uh, for other type of context, but right now, almost all of our use cases on premise. Of course. Uh, early on in your presentation, you talked about the two different types of models that you had, right? So you had one that was simpler and was used online, and you had one that did the batch scoring, right? Yeah. So if I understand correctly, the batch scoring doesn't depend on the particular context of the user who's making the request at that moment. We don't know the context of the user. Correct. And, and so you mentioned that you take results from both and feed them back in the request. Can you talk a little bit about that combining? Is it literally that you just take three context-specific ones and three batch ones, or is there you put them together, or is there something more complicated? So um, it's, it's actually, I, I, I'm going to elaborate a little bit more there. So uh, in a, we understand there are different elements that we could use uh, to understand the quality of a, of a deal, for instance. Uh, it's not the same behavior of a male or a female approaching to a type of deal. So, in the moment we have the, uh, the, the, um, the login event, we know there was a female or a male uh, pr uh, purchase, uh, purchase or not that deal, or viewing it, or clicking on it, or just uh, not doing any interaction but going to another deal. Like, all these events are important. So, in that, in that moment, in the, in the batch scoring, we create a uh, to a, a, a matrix, so we have female and male, so we're going to score if it was a male, and we're going to f uh, score it again as it was a female. So, but then you can have a context as, for example, distance. So, I do know that this model, the local, the, the local dis, uh, mo um, deals were purchased, uh, and there was a location, and there was a location on the, on the phone or the website. There was, there was a distance applied for where the physical distance where that deal were, and where the, the, the purchase occurred. So we can understand, okay, that's, that this event occurred and which distance. So we can understand how the quality of the deal varies during different buckets of distances. So we make it a little bit more complex. So though now we don't have a female and male bucket, now we have a female with distance buckets, buckets and a male with distance buckets. So we are producing a huge matrix, an n-dimensional matrix, which each element has its particular score. That kind of work as a prior in this case. So when we go to the online, so this information is core offline. We assume that it, you put all the buckets of distances, we put all the information for male or females when we have for, per deal, and when we, we index that information in Elasticsearch. When you see Elasticsearch, you're gonna see the deal quality score, and you're gonna see that goes wider and wider and wider for each one of the buckets. You can see, okay, there's a male versus a female, which is the probability of conversion rate based on what's a male and and it was between zero and two miles, or two and four miles, et cetera. When the information comes from the request, we actually know it's a female or it's a male, or some known as could be as a, a poss possibility. So then we go to that bucket, okay, so it's a female, okay. From the distance of the user, where the user is, to the, to the distance, to the deal, in which bucket occur, occur in this element. And this is the score we plug in, and we use it as a feature itself. 
So that, that the output of that offline model actually is an input in the online model as a feature itself, which is the, the quality of that deal. So we have the contextual information of the user, we have the contextual information of the request, and then we have this pre-processed information which acts as a prior as well as a, in the feature vector. And then we train it and we, and we do our predictions. You mentioned you deploy on-premises. Uh, what sort of infrastructure are you using on-premises? Are you virtualized or...? Yeah, well, most of the, most of VM hosts right now, the, both in CentOS elements. And uh, we, are, so we, and we have as well Elasticsearch clusters. So, but uh, actually, um, if this is the guy who knows more infrastructure than me. We're ready right now, but we'll move to the cloud right now. So over the next two years, we'll start to be stocking something like this. So for right now, it's just VM hosts. And uh, he is, uh, he works with me and he is like the guy who knows more infrastructure than me. So, so just a question, uh, so, so H2 is a distributed machine learning engine and Spark has an LA which is, has a distributed machine learning library. Why did you guys, you know, consider something like that about that? So, uh, what the first reason comes to my mind is that with MLA we couldn't find a way to export the, the, the model uh, using Elasticsearch. And we, want, we need to use an Elasticsearch. Uh, H2O brought something called Mojo. And uh, that Mojo is, a, one of, for me, is one of the, the, the most important elements of H2O is that it's a portable model that can be used in any context. And our context was Elasticsearch context. And we need it there and we can grab the module and then we can put it in Elasticsearch and it will be doing the scoring for us there. That's, that's, that's the best thing, that, uh, the, the top in my head. Uh, then you have, of course, each one has a different implementation of the, of the algorithm, but the algorithm is more or less the same. It's the same, you, you, follow, you can go actually to H2O, you can see the, the algorithm and you can say, yeah, it's the same algorithm but it's the output of it, of the mojo. That's, that's what we caught. And as well as using Spark and Water that is natively used for, for Spark context, uh, actually help us a lot. Do you use Spark and Water in production? Well, the Spark and Water, we use it for training the data. Well, the training the model, sorry. Uh, with the mojo, we use it in production. So yes, kind of, it produced the model gonna be used in, model, in production. Any other questions? Well, okay. thank you very much for, for being here. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you.